Hey everyone, welcome back with another session of history. I hope you all are doing well. So today we'll continue the same chapter that is new empires and kingdoms. Now, in the previous session we have already discussed about uh, different Gupta rulers. All right. And uh, like how the Gupta dynasty was the golden age of peace and enlightenment. Along with that, what were the reasons of their downfall? Now today we'll start the proceedings with the Gupta administration. All right. So let's begin. Now uh, the Gupta rulers was known to be efficient rulers, and therefore were able to consolidate an empire as large as theirs for two hundred years. Now the king assumed elaborate titles like Paramvatarka, Parmeshwara. Maharaja Dhiraja, Chakravarti, so and also Samrat. Now, the king, the king had the absolute authority and was the head of the administration. Now, the king was assisted by several officials and a council of ministers that ensured the smooth functioning of the administration. Now, many administrative posts were hereditary. Now there is a reference of Samudra Gupta's court poet Hari Sena being a Mahadanda Nayaka, or you can call him as a chief judicial officer, as his father. Now, besides positions being made hereditary, one person could hold more than one office. For example, Hari Sena was also a Kumaramatmya and a Sandhi Vigrahiya. Or you can call him as the minister of war and peace. All right. Now the kingdom was divided into bhaktis or provinces, which were governed by the king representatives called ayuktas and kumaramatiyas. All right. And further, these bhaktis were further divided into vishyas or districts that were governed. By Vishyapatis. Now, along with them, Nagaras Rastis were the officers looking after the city administration, and the villages in the district were under the control of Gramikas. Now, the de- decentralization in administration was further extended to the military arrangement as well. Samantas or military leaders would provide their troops in time of war and in lieu of this help the military leaders were issued land grants now they could collect revenue from these land grants and maintain their armies as well sometimes these samantas became more powerful and tried to declare their independence and along with all this land tax was the main source of income during the gupta period all right so all these are about the gupta administration next we have that is we will talk about harsha vardhan now as i have said already like after the decline of the gupta empire like there were small kingdoms who were at constant warfare until the 7th century when the king of thaneshwar Harshavardhan consolidated all these small kingdoms under his control. Okay, now if we see, like there are different sources for Harshavardhan's period, include his biography. All right, literary sources that is his biography, Harsha Charita, that was written in Sanskrit and authored by Bhanu Bhatta, his court poet. Now, besides the Harsha Charita, the accounts of Foreign traveler Huntsang, who is known to have visited India during the rule of Harshavardhan. Now, Huntsang lived in Harshavardhan's court for eight years and carefully documented the developments taking place during his reign. Now, these literary sources also list the military conquest and cultural achievements. taking place during the time of Harshavardhan along with all this archaeological sources such as inscriptions and coins 
also provide a lot of information of Harshavardhan's rule. No. Main Sang's account also mentions that agriculture was the main occupation of people. Trade along with various crafts were also practiced. Although people lived a simple life, they still followed the caste system. Now there were different types of houses which were constructed with wood, bricks and dung. Now the city streets were circular. There was no parda system and women had the freedom to pursue an education. This was really wonderful. Now during the 7th century, Harshavardhan became a prominent ruler. He integrated his kingdom Thaneshwar with Kanauj and made Kanauj his capital. Now in his account, Swen Sang mentions that Harshavardhan had a very large army and annexed the territories of Bengal and Bihar. He also conquered Punjab, Eastern Rajasthan and the entire region from the Ganga Valley till Assam. Harshavardhan also attacked the Chalukyan king Pulakeshin II, but he was defeated. Now, along with all this, like learning and education during Harshavardhan's period was given much emphasis. In fact, he was a writer himself who had authored three plays in Sanskrit, like Ratnavali, Priyadarshika, and Nagananda. Now, besides Banabhatta, learned scholars like Subhandu and Dandin were a part of Harshavardhan's court. Now, he also gave the Nalanda University a, a huge grant of a hundred villages. Now, uh, Harshavardhan earlier he was a worshipper of Lord Shiva and he converted to Buddhism afterwards. Now, Harshavardhan patronized Buddhism and built different stupas. Now, a Buddhist convention was held at Nalanda University during his reign. Okay, so these are all about Harshavardhan. So that's all we have in this session. In the next session, we will discuss about Chalukyas and Pallavas and about their administration also. So until the next time, bye-bye.